So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Pedro Brito. I'm the Associate Dean for Executive Education and Business Transformation here at the school, at Nova Business School. And I'm pleased to, to tell you that I'm the host for today's webinar, Where to Focus by Nadim Abib. So Nadim will, will uh, lead the, the webinar. Um, for those who don't know Nadim, which is uh, one of the rock stars from the Nova Business School, is an expert on change management, organizational agility, and, uh, and questions like, how can we adjust to, uh, to remote working or moving from a standby position for uh, moving forward to, um, to, to the way organizations and our teams will work in the future. So these are just a few questions that Nadim hopefully will answer to all of us. Um, these are just a couple of ideas. So um, just a couple of reminders. I would uh, love to, to see you put your uh, questions on the Q&A on the bottom on the bottom of your Zoom. Um, not on the chat, the chat only for technical issues, if, uh, if you might. For, you can put the, the questions on the Q&A so I can select some of the best questions to a small discussion at the end of the, the, the webinar. Also, some of you have answer to the pool in the beginning of the webinar and I would love to challenge Nadim to uh, answers to, to, to answer to the results of that pool. So I hope you, you love this webinar and back to Nadim. Well thank you Pedro and, and, and welcome to everybody here tonight. Um, interesting times we live in and, and thank you for everybody who's answered. We've got a total of about 262 answers so far so I think Mariana, if you can just shut that down for a little bit and, and start sharing the results. Really interesting stuff here. Almost 95% of you are, are working from home, which I think is what we can expect. But I think more painful for most of us is that for almost 74% of people here, their business over the next three months is going to take a downward hit of anything from 30 to 50% and upwards. And more scarily, almost 25% of people here today are going to see a drop in business of almost 30, 70% over the next three months. And this is, this is painful for most of us. Simultaneously, most of us are working more from home than we did before. And I think this is interesting for, for many different aspects and something I, 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 I'll touch on you as we go along. But also what I think is interesting is many of us are still thinking we're achieving less. And, and this is concerning to me because it means that we're having a hard time adjusting and, and, and we're, we're, we're not achieving what we want to achieve, which, which is normal given the times we're living in. So let me just share with you a bit my vision on what I think we could be doing and, and how I think the world's moving forward. And I think the question in itself is quite important. Where to focus when everything is changing every day? And, and what do I mean by changing every day? I mean, you know, I, I remember, and I think most of us will be able to tell this story to our grandkids one day. You know, I was flying to Madeira on the 8th of March to teach there for five days. And every day on the news, it was getting clearer and clearer that something was coming. And every day we'd, we'd hesitate and we'd say, no, but it's going to be all right. And I don't think so. The schools would be sending emails every day saying, we don't know if we're going to reopen or not. We at Nava were having decisions every day of what we're having. Even when we realized we would have to stay home, we were rescheduling classes for May and June and thinking everything will return to normal. And still every day we switch on the news and we, we don't know what's going to happen. I think these are going to be big challenges for us moving forward. And in, this, in a sense, what's happening <coughs> what I call cognitive overload. We, we're sitting in a situation where we actually have more information than we know what to deal with. And more importantly, we're, we're, in a, we're in a world where the type of information we're getting, we don't know what to do, do with it. We're stuck with it, we're, we're, we're driving it. And just for people who like definitions, you know, cognitive overload occurs when the volume of information supply surpasses our ability to process it. And typically that's what I felt, and I think many of us felt this. And anybody who leads teams, runs clients, et cetera, et cetera, knows that the questions that were coming at us every day were things such as, when, when, when are we gonna go back to normal? What is gonna to happen to us? What solutions do we have? How can we overcome these things? And, and this is just huge overload on our brains. Now, for many of us, we kind of felt that we were always a step behind events. You know, we were always like, oh my God, I should have thought about this before, et cetera, et cetera. And I think most of us feel this. And, and interestingly enough, I, I was watching the, the press conference of Governor Cuomo in New York, which has become part of my daily viewing routine. What the hell, what, why am I watching things in New York? Just because he's coming across to me as somebody who's continuously dealing with issues, which he says, I'm always one step behind. It feels like we're behind this virus. This virus is always a step ahead of us. 
And I think most of us are feeling the same thing. And so our temptation, and I think it's a good temptation, is we understand that first we need to stop for a little bit. I need to stop and breathe. You know, things such as just switch off the news for a day. You know, if you're going to watch the news, watch it once a day, just switch off. Really, guys, log out of your email. You know, say no to a few conferences, get out of things for a little bit, stop for a little bit, because the reality is if you don't stop, the cognitive overload is not going to slow down and you're going to have enormous difficulty processing the data you have. The second thing is you need to focus. And I think we all feel this. You know, I need to start taking all this energy I have, all this energy I've got all around me, and I've got to do something with it. I need to take it somewhere because if I don't, what I'll end up doing is I'll end up reacting in every different direction. And to be honest with you, we can't react continuously under cognitive overload or we will burn out. And I think we're going to find a lot of people suffering more burnout in this phase at home than they did when they worked in the office. And then finally, we need to move forward. And I think most of us understand this. And most of us are looking to our leaders, asking them to help us do these three things. How do I stop to think? How do I gain focus so I can finally move forward? Because this concept of waiting and waiting and waiting is driving us crazy. And I think one of the biggest challenges we have is that. We're asking for answers so we can move forward. Now, this is not easy because <laughs> move forward to where? You know, when, when does life return to normal? Well, we can all say it's never gonna be normal again, but where do we move forward to? Do I start planning a return to the office? Do I start planning that I can start doing things I didn't do before? You know, I, you know for me, I'm a, I'm a teacher and a consultant. I, I depended essentially on moving around and meeting people and getting on planes and getting off planes. Where, where do I move forward to? Yeah. And I think this is really one of the first challenges we have. So, so let's take a step back and say, Okay, let's go back to the basics. You know, let's be honest about it. I'm an academic, we teach in academia. Let's go back to the basics. And for me, the first basic is the basics of business. So I'm gonna stop you now and say, let's not talk about COVID. Let's not talk about everything that's new in the world of disruption and exponential, et cetera. Let's go back to the basics of financial management for firms. Okay, now, most of you will know this, but firms typically report two types of financial statements. They have others, but these are the two core ones. The first one is what we call a profit and loss, a PNL. The Portuguese call it a demonstração de resultados. And typically, it's built up by really simple things. It's got sales, then it's got costs, and then at the end, you get the profit or the loss. And typically, this is done over a period of time, so January to March, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I don't need to say this because you know this. This typically measures the result of our activities looking past in time. And let's be honest about it, most of us, this is what we look at when we look at our business. This is what we look at when we look at our team. This is what we look at when we look at our organization, our costs at home, et cetera, et cetera. What we don't look enough at, and we know we should be looking more, is what we call the balance sheet, the balance. And what is a balance sheet? Well, a balance sheet has what we call assets, everything that is strong for me, that gives me positive abilities moving forward. It then has liabilities, things I owe. And finally, it has equity. It's the accumulated wealth I have developed over the past years that will give me some sort of muscle. Now, why do I like a balance sheet? Because a balance sheet, to a great extent, comes with a day. It is today, March 31st, April 1st, April 2nd. It is today. And the big difference between the balance sheet and the profit and loss is that while the profit and loss looks backwards, the balance sheet gives you a great idea of your ability to move forward. And this is really what we should be looking at now. Now, anybody who's listening to me today, who's been working over the past 10 years or 15 years, you know as well as I do that we normally never look at our balance sheet. We just look at our PL. Did I make my numbers? Could I make my numbers? And I go again, and I go again, and I go again, and I go again. I restart, I go again. But implicitly, we know we should have been looking more at our balance sheet because what we do know is it's our balance sheet that allows us to drive our PL forward. The bigger our assets, the stronger our assets, the more we can generate sales and reduce costs. The better equity we have, the more ability we have to invest moving forward. And to a great extent, I think one of the biggest mistakes we have been making over the past 10 years, with or without COVID, is we have been neglecting our balance sheet. And this is a problem because we haven't been building the assets to deal with uncertainty. And let's not kid ourselves, uncertainty has been around for a long time now. Yeah, if you just look at elections, you look at, at Brexit, you look at a lot of other things, we've had things we really did not expect. Now, why am I bringing this up? Because, you know, we need to go back to our basics, you know, my basics. And my basics really are very simple. What's my personal balance sheet looking like? What, what are my assets today? 
Yeah. What are my liabilities today? And what equity have I got saved up? Because let's be honest with you, if I don't clear that now, and I don't get a clear picture of that now, I'm going to be panicking every day in nerves. And we need to take a cold, hard look at our balance sheets today, because that's the first thing we need to do. I need to buy mental space. The second thing I need to do is look at my team's balance sheet. What is my team looking like today? Anybody here who's managing a team, many of you will be super surprised by how well your teams have reacted to this crisis, how they're coming out with stuff they didn't expect before, et cetera. You actually will probably realize that your team was much, had much stronger assets than you actually suspected. And this is phenomenal. You'll also see a lot of weaknesses in your structures that you didn't know existed. So you're getting a much clearer look at your balance sheet and you're going, oh God, you know, we should have corrected this. And let's be honest. A lot of this stuff you knew you should have been working on three years ago, two years ago, and one year ago, but you didn't. You know why? Because you were obsessing with your PL, you were chasing your numbers, so you didn't build your balance sheet. And now you have that opportunity. And then finally, of course, what's my organization's balance sheet looking like? Now you'll say to me, oh, but you know, I have money problems, I don't. You know, I'll, I'll be honest, and, and tomorrow there'll be another webinar on, on, on more of the economic side of things. But for me, a lot of what the government has done is saying to you, listen, we can get you money, we can help. Take care of your cash flows, all right? Just focus on your balance sheet so you can get your PL moving forward in the future. And I think we all need to take a better look at that. And so for me, really, this is where we need to focus each one of us individually, understanding that what I'm looking to is, first, I need to stop to take a deep breath. Second, I need to focus. And third is I need to move forward. So, so here's my, what my, I've been doing to myself. And I think it's been working for me. Um, I'm at home with my kids. Um, last week, I wanted to sell my kids. Today, I actually like them a little bit more. I'm discovering parts of my balance sheet I didn't know I had before, so this is phenomenal. And, you know, and, and so for me, what I have done and what I've decided to do, and it's worked very well for me, and I really recommend it to most people, is first stop and take stock. Take a look at what you have around you. You know, I, I sat down and I said to myself, okay, if I do not work for five months, what will this family's P&L balance sheet look like come September 1st. Let's just stop and take stock of it. What have I got? What don't I have? What do I need? Et cetera, et cetera. And, and though it was a painful exercise, the reality is it gave me breathing space. Why? Because that's the second step. You know, I need to buy myself space to breathe. Right now, I seem like I'm reacting everywhere. I need to get ahead of this. I need to move and become beyond this crisis. I need to really find myself space. And what I did was by saying to myself, okay, zero work before September 1st, I actually bought myself space to breathe and said, okay, I've got stuff now. And then I can start working what's important. It's saying, what are my assets for tomorrow? Which ones do I want to build? You know, some are new to me. I'll be honest with you, for the past three years, we at NABA have been talking about, can we do online stuff? Can we reach a wider audience in the world? Once we get rid of this geographical limitation of them having to come here, we never did anything about it. We're doing it now and it's proving really, really interesting to discuss learning processes and anything like that. So really start working on your asset base moving forward. Now, you know, and, and just to sort of move it forward, there's good news and there's bad news. You know, let's look at the, the good news here. The key assets for your business. We have always known that what you know, your skill set, your knowledge base, was core for your ability to push your career, to serve your clients, to run your team, and to develop results for your business. And guess what? This was true before COVID. This is true after COVID. There's no doubt about it that this will continue to be true after COVID. So this hasn't changed. And I think this is important. A lot more things have not changed than things have changed. And I think sometimes we need to spend more time thinking about that. I think the second point, and just as important here, is that we, we, we to a great extent, sorry about this, I'm just gonna move something out the way here. Your ability to think straight was fundamental before COVID and will continue to be after COVID. And what does it take for you to think straight, guys? It takes you to take a cold, hard look at what you got, your liabilities, your equity, and what your strengths are, and realizing where you are and having that honest look about it and having that honest discussion with your team, having that honest discussion with your boss, having that honest discussion with your customers. And these are fundamental, I think, for most of us. The third thing is your team and your asset base. They were always an asset. Ironically, it's something we've been discussing a lot and I've been discussing a lot is that accounting and finance and, 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 and fiscality has to catch up with this new reality. For the past five years, every team leader I meet, every CEO I meet says the same thing. Our people are our biggest asset. They should be on our balance sheet, but they're not. Well, now we have a chance to look at them as assets and understand what we really mean by it. And so for me, they were an asset before COVID and they'll continue to be after COVID. I think 
the organization's culture. We always knew this was so very important for us, and this was important for us before COVID, and it's still important to us after COVID. And then finally, something people say to me, our biggest asset is our relationship with our clients. Absolutely, this was true before COVID, and this was true after COVID. I think for me, one of the biggest challenges here is to accept that even before COVID, we didn't do enough on these areas. We didn't do enough on understanding, first of all, what our asset base was, was and we didn't invest enough in it. We didn't have time. We, remember, we were chasing, we were chasing, we were chasing. Well, guess what? We now have time. And I think the most important thing you can do today is to sit down, take stock, analyze your balance sheet, and decide what assets do I want my team, my organization, and myself to have over the next six to 12 months? And what am I gonna to do today to start building that forward? What am I gonna learn for myself to make myself a better manager, a better leader, et cetera, et cetera? What am I gonna to want to be able to think straight? What kind of budget am I gonna build? What kind of clarity am I gonna give? What kind of cash savings am I gonna do? What, what decisions am I gonna to make today to let me get ahead of this? How am I gonna sit down with my team and use their, their energy to drive the business forward? How am I gonna use our organizational culture to build even more strength? And how am I gonna work my relationship with my clients so that they continue to improve, so that one day, no matter how, be it online, offline, face-to-face, -face, in a restaurant, in a conference room, or with a face mask, we can go back to creating value across the whole economy. Because in the end, that's what it's about. And I think something we've been saying for the past five or six years is really simple. Many of us grew up in a world of business where we needed to predict the future to be able to run our business. You know, we keep doing this. If I can predict sales next year, I know how many salespeople to hire. If I can predict how many customers I'm gonna get, I can decide how many lawyers to hire. If I can predict this, I can do this. Well, guys, we've been told year after year since 2010 that we can't predict the future. And once again, it has happened. So once and for all, please, Let's stop looking at our PNL that measures the past and let's look at our balance sheet that predicts the future. And for me, if you can't predict the future, the focus of everything we do must be on building skills, teams, and structures that can deal with any future. Now, is that easy? No, because it requires that you first take stock, take a look at what you've got, take a look at everything, cold hard look with this time you have to do deeper analysis. Two, Try to define the asset base you need moving forward. And three, start building a plan to move in that direction. And guys, we have a lot of time, so let's get started. Thank you so much for your attention today. This is just a small taste of what we're doing here at NAVA, and I hope that everybody enjoyed it. I'm more than happy to take any questions now or anything else. Pedro? Yeah, uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, that uh, some of our um, attendees had put. The first one was uh, small companies are struggling with cash flow right now. So do you have any type of recommendation about it? Yeah, I, I think it's back to that again. Take a look at your balance sheet and say to yourself, okay, cold hard look, what will happen to me if I have no cash coming in in the next five months? Number two, can I get access to the interest rate loans the government is going? Number three, what can I strip in terms of cash when I got? This is a cold, hard look. You know, I, I would really build dramatic budgets for the next, go back and say until September 1st, I can't do anything. Strip it down and get ahead of it. It might be painful exercise to do, but the reality is I suspect most of us are not doing it and therefore we're constantly hoping something will change. Guys, I, I'll be honest with you. It's your balance sheet. Anything outside, the type of surprise you want has to be positive. And if you take cold, hard looks to move forward, you'll get positive surprises. If you keep hoping the outside will get better, trust me, the type of surprise you'll get might be positive, but they'll also be negative. And very small organizations cannot continuously deal with that shock. Right. Um, another question, and I think uh, I will try to put some uh, two other questions, but the second one was, what should it be the biggest priority of a people leader at this point? I think to a great extent, it's, it's that thing. It's, it's, you know, help your people to understand what they need to do. One of the biggest things I'm catching across the, the whole spectrum, students and everybody else is, we all wanna work. We wanna do things. We wanna move forward. We, 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 we hate the standing still waiting. We're not designed to wait till this is over. 
And I think we want to do things. And as leaders, really, it's that clarity. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? And I think the big challenge for many leaders is how do I define what we want to do? And that's why I'm, I'm really encouraging leaders to, to go back and look at the balance sheet. Don't look at how am I going to get sales, but look at what are the strengths I want to develop in my structure so that these strengths will solve my problems and not so much that I will have to give answers because I don't think any leader who's honest can give any answers to the questions most of us have, which is, when is this over? Will I have my job? Will we go back to earning as much as we did before? We don't know. What we do know is this. If you work on increasing the strength of your team, if you work on continuing to support your clients, even if they can't pay you, if you work on continuously developing more knowledge base, more knowledge in everything you do, then when the economy returns, you will be much stronger and you'll come back much faster. And that's really the biggest time. And, and, and you know, people say to me, oh, but I need money to invest. Portugal is one of the few countries in the world where we keep saying innovation takes money. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking really it's about understanding that, you know, look at me, look at us here. Pedro, me and you have been talking about this with everybody at the school. You know, how do we as a school deal with this? Well, we had two choices. Choice number one is let's pray lessons come back in September. Option number two is let's try to do something online and see how it works. Option number three is let's start learning online and why don't we open the world and become a global business school that can serve everybody. And I think these are kind of the ways we as leaders have to start doing things moving forward. One, one of the questions is uh, related with uh, client relationship. Uh, how can we focus on relationship building with clients when they are struggling to keep their businesses? Yeah, I think this is always an interesting question because let's be honest about it. Most of us will admit that in the past, we never built enough relationship with our clients because we were too busy trying to chase the P&L. So what we did was we were very transactional. I will tell you I have a relationship with you, but really what I'm going to do is as long as you come in and buy from me, and I, then I'll be nice to you. You now have a chance to prove the difference. You now have the chance to say, no, the relationship is the most important thing. You might not be able to buy from me today. Hell, your business might collapse in the next three months, but this relationship is here for you. And I think if more of us started doing this, we would produce much better results moving forward. Yeah, there is a question regarding leadership again, um, uh, more specifically on motivation. So how can we keep motivated and focus our team when we don't really know what's going to happen next month. Yeah, I, Do you have any type of strategies that we can implement at this point? Yeah, I, I think, first of all, let me, let me be clear here. I don't think our job is to motivate people. I think our job is to remove demotivation. Okay, so I think typically, and, 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 and it sounds brutal, but a lot of people are naturally motivated. If you're not naturally motivated in your job, then maybe this is not the job for you. I'm, I'm not trying to be critical here, but that's just how it works. I think sometimes leadership can create demotivating cultures. You know, we can, we can push people in the right direction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, how do I allow people to take all this energy and push it in the right direction? And really what everybody wants, I think, is to feel that they're moving forward. And so as leaders, we need to give them that clarity. We need to say to them, listen, this is what's important now, go. This is what's important now, let's go. And it's not just me. Listen, every one of you who's been on social media has seen the amount of people who wanna help just to do things. We wanna do things. And I think the biggest asset on the biggest balance sheet in the world is the collective talent we see sitting in the structure. And I think this is all about helping people put all this energy to work to create something no matter what it is. And that's really the job of any leader. Right. Uh, a challenging question. Could you exemplify what does it mean to look at the team as an asset or a person as an asset? Yeah, I think to a great extent, one of the biggest challenges we have is, is, is for many people in many organizations, for too many years, people's have been a cost, right? So basically, I have a salary, it costs me money, what do I do with it, et cetera, et cetera. Try to go back and say to yourself, okay, this person, how much can they add to the value of my organization? You know, how much are they adding? And I, thought, I don't think we've had enough time to look at this in the past. When, you, when you're running around, you know, I, I work in Portugal like most people and, and even across the world and people didn't have time. They'd say, yeah, yeah, he's good, but I don't have time now. You know, I don't have time to give feedback. I don't have time for this. I don't have time for this. The reality is we're not, we didn't invest enough time in our people. We didn't give them enough coaching. We didn't give them enough stuff. And, and, and if they were assets, if we see them as assets and we invest in them and they grow, the idea, basic idea here is that these people will come to us with potential solutions, you know? And I think this is what's phenomenal about it is you suddenly have people coming left, right, and center and saying, I have an idea. Do you mind if I do it? Can I push this forward, et cetera, et cetera. And this is what, you know, 
to a great extent, the agile movement was all about, and, 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 and I think we all need to be really honest here. We have never needed to be more agile than today. And so as leaders, we need to give people that clarity, that ability to move forward. And, and for me, that clarity means I need to anchor myself somewhere. And that's why I'm trying to push people to go away from the PNL. The PNL is all about sales and costs. Yeah, I get it. Move towards your balance sheet. What is the asset that will make us the best company in the world in this field within the next year or two? That's what we should be doing. Right. Uh, final question. Um, we are living a, in a situation where people are innovating more and more. Does it mean that we are creating a new wave of uh, entrepreneurs? Well, we, we, we've been creating a new wave of entrepreneurs for some time now, you know, because to a great extent, my, my analysis of entrepreneurship is really simple. I see entrepreneurship as what I call a response to failure. So typically a, a, an entrepreneur sees that some companies are failing in a segment and therefore goes to fill that gap. And I think, you know, to, to, we, we, we're all seeing now that COVID is challenging a lot of things. Now, will this create entrepreneurs? I, I don't know. I think it will show the companies with the best cultures, with the strongest leadership, those are the ones who, who will arise from this. And I think it would be a mistake for these companies to not strengthen this balance sheet in these times. And I suspect some will do the exact opposite. They'll go to the PL, they'll cut back on everything, they'll slash back on everything, and I think it'll weaken their balance sheet for the return. When we came out of the 2010 financial crisis, one of the biggest concerns I had was we came out with banks with very weak balance sheets. And it has taken them 10 years to rebuild those balance sheets to start contributing to the economy. We can't afford that in terms of our balance sheet when it comes to talent and customer relations. And that's why my appeal to people is that focus everything on that right now, because that's really what's gonna matter. Right, so Nadim, just um, a final question for myself. Any final recommendations that you, you would love to, to give to everyone? Well, I, I think keep talking people. I, I, I don't have answers. I don't think any of us do. You know, I, I know that I'm at my age thinking of my balance sheet. You know, what, what is it that I want to do next? How can I learn more? Can, how can I develop more? You know, I'll, I'll be logging in tomorrow to say, I think it's better tomorrow, talking about an economic perspective. Let's keep doing this. Let's keep talking and, 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 and let's keep doing it. But for me and, and, and Let's, you know, and, and I put this on the last slide on purpose. Let's, let's just get this started. Let's stop <laughs> waiting. Right. So thank you very much, Nadim. Thank, thank you, you everyone for much. making part of the, this uh, fantastic webinar with uh, Nadim, Where to Focus. Just a quick note that, uh, just to say that the webinar, it's going to be available on the, the website on role to play .pt. So if you want, uh, tomorrow will be available, as well the other webinars that we will be um, doing for the, the rest of April, every day at 6 p.m. Uh, during uh, more or less half an hour. So that's all for today. Keep safe and keep learning. Thank you.